Should we go ahead and start? All right. Well, welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is David Gam, and I'm the director of the McPherson Eye Research Institute. And I'm also a pediatric ophthalmologist and a retinal stem cell researcher at the Weissman Center. So I, I get around a bit. Um, and it's my pleasure to uh, kind of kick things off here today um, and also introduce to you um, the Institute. So those of you who aren't aware of the McPherson Eye Research Institute, we've been around for oh, over 15 years now. And we're a community of researchers um, that is now upwards of 200 members um, here at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, but also uh, UW institutions um, across the state. And what's unique about us is that we're not uh, simply uh, medical specialists or biologists, but we embrace anybody and everybody that's interested in vision. So psychologists, engineers, uh, veterinary ophthalmologists, uh, because we believe that by putting people together that normally wouldn't interact, that we can innovate and do things that we otherwise couldn't in our own little silos. And we have uh, three main missions. One, the main one is research, but also education and outreach. And that's what brings us here today, uh, is our education and outreach mission. Um, and uh, we've been doing vision, in, uh, vision at the zoo, Arboretum, and now Biotech Center for many, many years. We do it once a year. And we try to uh, educate the community and make it fun, uh, learning how different animals see. Um, and that's important for at least three reasons that I can think of. One is we care about animals, and we want to make sure that they can see to the best of their ability throughout their lifespan. Um, we also want to be able to interact with them as humans uh, safely and effectively. That's why I think we get a lot of questions about what does my dog see, what does my cat see. Uh, but then there are also animals that we got to be careful with sometimes, too, and we want to know how they see as well, too, so that we can give them their space. And then lastly, and in a very humanly selfish way, we can learn from them. So animals uh, represent millions of adaptations for different sens sensory systems, including vision. And we can take that information and use it to build better lives for ourselves, whether that be instruments um, or therapies. So examples might be learning how a lobster sees so we can make better cameras to detect motion. Um, or taking something as simple as a bacteria and understanding how it sees light and using that to build a therapeutic to help blind people see, which has now gone into clinical trial. So that's a big spectrum of different ways that we use how creatures see uh, to build uh, instruments, equipment, uh, cameras, and also to help us preserve our vision and uh, maybe even enhance our vision sometime in the future. So with that, I will uh, introduce Dr. Dick DeBilzig, who is a professor emeritus of veterinary pathology and also the um, founder of the Comparative Ocular Pathology Laboratory of Wisconsin, which is itself an, a unique, one-of-a-kind uh, group here at the University of Wisconsin. We kind of have, a, we have a, a history of doing that here in Wisconsin, kind of doing our own thing. Um, and it's an amazing uh, institution by itself, um, maybe for another day, or I don't know if you're going to introduce it. but. Uh, with that, I'm going to I'll turn it over to Dick, and welcome again. Am I working? And is there a pointer up here somewhere? Oh, I think, I think they want you to do this. That way the oh. on online. Right. Good advice. OK, so uh, my name is Dick DeBilzig. Uh, as David said, I'm a, a, a pathologist at the veterinary school. Uh, Madison's my hometown, so I came back to Madison uh, when, the, when, there was, when they were hiring uh, pathologists at the veterinary school, which was 1983, and uh, it's, been my ho uh, 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 it's been my back home again, uh, home uh, uh, since then. Uh, I came from the University of Pennsylvania, where I was mentored by a world-famous veterinary ophthalmologist uh, uh, in my uh, ophthalmology interests, uh, and so when I came, I uh, made it a contingent that I would be able to have a mail a mail in eye pathology service, which has has now become the the uh, uh, comparative <coughs> uh, ocular pathology laboratory of Wisconsin. Uh, 
And, uh, and we've had this, the outreach committee of the McPherson Eye Research Institute has had this talk for a uh, number of years, as, as Dave Gamm uh, um, mentioned. But this is the first time we've had uh, a, 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 a in-person aspect of this for three years. Uh, so now it's a, a combined uh, hybrid meeting, uh, and it's great to see uh, people uh, in, in, in person again uh, as, we, uh, go, as we move forward. So I thought I'd uh, just mention a few things uh, by way of introduction to Koplau and maybe uh, get an understanding of how and why uh, I'm able to, uh, uh, to give a talk like this, uh, why I've developed an in interest in, in this uh, uh, type of thing. So this is just a, a, a chart uh, of the, uh, uh, of the spe uh, species that we, ha we see at the Koplau uh, lab. We're, we're a mail-in eye pathology service. We provide a diagnostic service for veterinary ophthalmologists around the country or around the world. And in July of 22, we had 89,000. This is out of date already because now we have about 95,000 cases. And as you can see, the huge bulk of what we get are dogs. The next, a distant second, but still a major component is our cat eyes. And then uh, uh, in third place, by a, a long place, but still much higher than any, anything else, would be the horse eyes, the three uh, domestic animals that we deal with uh, uh, the, uh, are, the, are the same that a, a veterinary ophthalmologist would deal with. But I have always had an interest in uh, comparative anatomy. Uh, uh, when I used to run the lab, uh, I uh, uh, made it a point to offer our services to zoos and aquariums and research scientists who studied uh, uh, un unusual eye diseases. Uh, there's one particular ophthalmologist who is just fascinated with uh, uh, evolution of the eye, and he would go out of his way to send us uh, uh, extremely interesting uh, specimens. So, uh, so we also have a, uh, th this says uh, uh, 5,000, some odd, 5,300 uh, uh, cases, uh, which we would call exotic. Any, in, our, uh, in our collection, anything that's not a, dog, cat, or horse, we, uh, we designate as being exotic. So this is, uh, you can see that uh, this was uh, uh, put together a while ago. It's, uh, it's not trivial to put a chart like this together, so I didn't do it again, but uh, this was uh, about 4,000 cases, and this is a breakdown of the, uh, of the uh, uh, basically the type of animal uh, uh, for which we have uh, specimens uh, in, in the lab. And again, you can see that uh, far and away our most common would be a mammal, and then we have about a thousand, uh, at least when this was put together, we had about a thousand birds, uh, about 250 uh, reptiles, and uh, uh, a, a scattering then of amphibians, pretty good collection of bony fish, a few sharks and rays, and then we, uh, uh, just mostly for, for fun, um, and also because of this guy, Ivan Schwab, who sends us some interesting specimens, we have a, a few uh, arthropods and, and mollusks as well. Uh, um, to make, thing, make things interesting. So it's from, this, uh, from these collections that um, my, uh, I'm able to satisfy my curiosity and my interest in, in uh, co comparative, uh, comparative anatomy. I uh, retired in 2014, although I'm still, I'm still uh, very much associated with the, lab, with the Koplau lab. Since my retirement, uh, uh, and especially in the COVID, uh, while, I, while I was home with, COVID, with the COVID pandemic, I uh, threw myself into trying to learn uh, as much as I could online uh, from uh, YouTube videos, et cetera, uh, about evolution. So I'm, um, I'm going to talk about uh, snake eyes in the context of, uh, of evolution. One of my major take-home messages from this is to show how, not only how snake eyes uh, work and differ from other animals, but I want to uh, highlight the fact that uh, among the, uh, the reptiles that are uh, closely associated with snakes, snakes have considerably different eyes uh, uh, the, the, uh, than others. And I want to just touch on perhaps uh, why that is. So I want to uh, give a shout out to the, uh, to the uh, time tree of life, which is illustrated down here. Here's the... URL. Uh, if you're at all interested in, in this type of thing, this is a great uh, website uh, to visit. You can put in the, the name of, a, uh, of two taxa, let's say a, a human and an elephant, uh, 
and uh, bingo, uh, uh, Time Tree of Life will give you when the last com how long ago the last common ancestor was, and it'll uh, point you directly to the research which, which is pertinent to that uh, uh, particular question. Or you can put in a whole uh, group of animals, uh, uh, and it'll it'll create a uh, phylogeny like you like you're seeing here. So I did this uh, on the Time Tree of Life uh, for for uh, all the vertebrates, and uh, this is what. Uh, uh, this is what came, uh, came out. <clears throat> I've highlighted here the reptiles. And you'll notice that uh, we have birds uh, uh, um, uh, among the reptiles. And what's missing here, because this is only extant uh, animals, animals that are still alive today, <clears throat> what's missing here is uh, along uh, this line that uh, ends up in birds would be all the dinosaurs. Not, uh, birds uh, evolved from the, from the two-legged uh, uh, carnivorous dinosaurs, of which T. rex is one, uh, but uh, 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 birds would be more closely related to the whole group of dinosaurs than they, than they would be to any of the other uh, uh, still alive reptiles. And then uh, we'll also pay attention to uh, the, this uh, group here. The two, I'm not going to talk about the tuatara. The tuatara is a lizard. Uh, it's the, it's uh, gen genetically the most ancient of the, of the lizards. And that's all I'm going to uh, really say about it. And lizards would include uh, 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 your iguanas and your Komodo dragons and your uh, geckos, chameleons, and interestingly enough, also snakes. <clears throat> so here's the same thing, concentrating more on the, uh, uh, on the lizards. And uh, notice uh, in terms of timeline, I can't find the, ah, here. In terms of timeline, <clears throat> uh, this whole group um, really started uh, at, at about the same time as the Jurassic uh, uh, period. So this is the Mesozoic uh, down here, up, up to here. So this is the period of dinosaurs. Uh, so um, much of this evolution uh, uh, and, and, and speciation occurred at the same time as the, as the uh, uh, dinosaurs. Uh, the interesting, very interesting to me is that the gecko, the, 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 the body form of the, of the gecko is among the most ancient of the, of the now still, still alive uh, uh, vertebrates. But uh, the, uh, the, in, in the, in the, in the uh, fossil record, fossils that can be identified as being snake or snake-like uh, 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 differentiated not uh, uh, earlier than many of the other uh, uh, currently alive uh, uh, lizard taxa, and they're uh, most closely related to the uh, uh, monitor lizards and the Komodo dragon. Interestingly, in terms of uh, taxonomy and anatomy, they're also interested in the giant uh, sea-dwelling uh, carnivores, the mosasaurs, uh, uh, etc. But other lizards, iguanas uh, and, and chameleons, uh, uh, <coughs> uh, didn't uh, radiate, didn't differentiate until uh, later on, but all uh, in the in the time of dinosaurs, <clears throat> which is uh, uh, going to be important. So, like I said, uh, uh, one of my goals here is to show how snake eyes uh, and th hence snake vision is uh, different than uh, uh, s than <clears throat> uh, many of the other uh, uh, reptiles. Uh, let's go back. Even go back to here. <clears throat> Uh, the lizards, the birds and lizards, uh, differentiated uh, way back, well before dinosaurs, back in the in the uh, uh, Devonian area, the Mississippian area, uh, and they were uh, 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 fossil records suggest that from the earliest times they were cold-blooded animals. Uh, so uh, because of that, they, it was mandated that they come out and, and live during the, uh, during the heat of the day so they could ho soak up sunlight to, uh, to, uh, to kickstart their metabolism. The uh, animals, uh, what they call uh, mammal-like reptiles, uh, uh, again, it's hard to judge uh, completely from the fossil record, but there's a, a lot of lines of evidence that suggest that already in the early days uh, that they were um, more warm-blooded and, and probably have... Uh, 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 survived uh, uh, preferentially in, uh, uh, by coming out at night, uh, uh, et cetera. So if you're going to be, if you're, if you're going to evolve and you have to be out in the bright sunlight, 
then you're probably going to involve sight that takes advantage of large amounts of light and uh, allows you to acquire eyes that are uh, specialized in visual acuity. Whereas if you're, uh, if you're <coughs> evolved from species that are coming out at night, you're probably going to evolve eyes that are specialized in visual sensitivity. So, uh, so I guess I have to preface that uh, 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 again by saying uh, during, the, during the age of dinosaurs, there's another factor that comes into play. Any animal that was going to survive has to have some sort of tactic for, to, to survive dinosaur predation. And that's true of both the uh, mammals that are alive today. Uh, uh, it's not particularly so true of the small reptiles that we have uh, today, but uh, it's, it's thought that snakes survived uh, dinosaur predation by uh, becoming burrowing animals. There's a competing theory that, the, that they were... Uh, that, that they evolved uh, in the water as, as swimming animals. But I, uh, in, in my opinion, the, the evidence for them being burrow, uh, specialized in burrowing uh, is probably more likely. So I'm going to start out by showing you the, the features of, a, uh, of most of the lizard eyes. This would be true of the chameleons, the geckos, the uh, iguanas, uh, uh, but uh, but many of these features will, you'll, you'll see will be lost in the in the snake, <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> and and again this is a these are eyes that are adapted for a high degree of visual acuity. Uh, think of them much like birds. Most of these features that I'm going to show you are also present even to a more sophisticated degree in in bird eyes. So the next picture is just going to illustrate the features <clears throat> that we see in the lizard eyes that have been lost in the snake eyes. Uh, and so the, uh, the, uh, the snakes who adapted a burrowing uh, uh, existence underground where there's no light, they uh, probably lost uh, uh, sophistication, anatomic sophistication in their eyes, uh, just, like, uh, uh, just like mammals uh, probably did. Uh, but uh, they have lost this uh, specialized function in the, at the equator of their lens, uh, which I refer to as the uh, annular pad that have lost this highly vascularized structure which provides a blood supply to the inner portion of the retina called the conus papillaris. They have lost cartilage in their, in their sclera. Now every kind of a vertebrate eye, with the exception of snakes and mammals, has cartilage in their, in their sclera. So that's uh, uh, interesting that they've, <clears throat> that they've lost that. And uh, then they have lost uh, this uh, scleral ossicle uh, and many birds Reptiles, fish, etc., have have a scleral ossicle, a bone in their eye, which has a number of different functions. Uh, uh, but for for uh, for the time being, we'll just say that that it's there. And again, uh, 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 snakes uh, ha have lost uh, that uh, particular structure. <coughs> and this. Uh, uh, illustration uh, comes from uh, a, a wonderful book, uh, which is written by uh, 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 Walls, uh, uh, the the uh, uh, the uh, uh, adaptation and, and radiation of the of the vertebrate eye, which is it, it was written in the 40s. Uh, it's just mind blowing, uh, com comprehensive. Sa same the same with this picture. I'm not going to go. Uh, it's a little bit hard to. Uh, talk about detail here. Uh, some of the important features I'll pick up again, but uh, the the lens is minus the uh, that specialized component. Uh, uh, there's no cartilage in the eye. Uh, I guess I w uh, went over all these things uh, uh, before. I'm going to uh, come back to. There's a very interesting specialized structure that snake eyes do have, which I'll come back to, and that's a a a, a, spec uh, a, a structure which covers the front of the eye. It's a fusion of the eyelids. Uh, and we'll talk about that in, in, in more detail uh, uh, as we uh, uh, move forward. So uh, in about 66 million years ago, a meteor uh, uh, hit the Earth and uh, almost instantly wiped out the, the uh, non-avian dinosaurs. Uh, and uh, a, a scattering of uh, mammalian uh, species survived. Uh, 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 the small uh, uh, theropod dinosaurs, which are the birds, uh, uh, survived, uh, and all of those things radiated again 
and uh, snakes uh, 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 also survived, uh, uh, and then uh, were able to, to live uh, free of the worry of dinosaur predation after that, and radiated into a whole bunch of different uh, 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 forms. Uh, Will, Will might talk more about that. Uh, I'm just going to talk a little bit about snakes that, are, that have radiated to uh, be either diurnal or, or nocturnal. Uh, but before I get into that, I want, I, want you, I want to call your attention to the fact that the, uh, the visible portion of the snake eye, as seen here, uh, you can see that it's surrounded by scales, and what's missing is eyelids. Uh, you may know already that snakes uh, do not, uh, don't, don't have eyelids, and therefore they don't blink. And I'll get into it a little bit more. They also don't have, a, uh, on the outside of their eye, they don't have a tear film, <coughs> which I think is uh, very interesting. If you come across a snake that has a round pupil, it's likely to be a diurnal uh, snake. If you come across a snake that has a slit pupil, it's likely to be a, 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 a nocturnal snake. Uh, uh, and again, Will can correct me if, uh, if I'm wrong about this, but I think that all of the venomous snakes are, uh, are, have a, a slit pupil as well. Probably not the recommended way to, if you come across a snake in the, in the grass, probably not recommended to uh, uh, get close enough to study whether it has a slit, a slit pupil or not. <laughs> so this is just uh, the, uh, sticking on this diurnal versus nocturnal. <clears throat> a retina adapted for diurnal vision is going to have a, 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 a propensity of uh, cone photoreceptors, which are uh, plump, so there can't be as many of them. And so it's going to have, uh, 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 this is the, these are the nuclei. Each individual cone has a nucleus. These are the nuclei of the cone in a excuse me, in a diurnal snake. And po the point here is that they have very few cells in this photoreceptor layer, the outer layer of the retina, but they have lots of ganglion cells, which, is the, which are the cells that send a message to the brain. Whereas a nocturnal snake is going to have lots of cells in the outer nuclear layer. These are the nuclei of, the, uh, of this rod-rich nocturnal snake. Rods take up much less space in the retina than, than cones do, so in order to fill up the retina, <coughs> uh, you, you, you can have lots and lots of uh, individual cells and very few uh, ganglion cells uh, because the, the, the goal of a nocturnal of nocturnal vision of dim light vision is to uh, make use of the, of the tiny amount of light that might be available uh, uh, sacrificing uh, visual acuity and that, and that doesn't require as much information being sent to the to the brain <clears throat> now we're going to talk about uh, the this uh, business of not having eyelids and uh, having a uh, covering in, in front of the eye, which is probably the if you if you uh, if you know nothing else about snake uh, eyes, uh, especially from the point of view of a, of a veterinary ophthalmologist, you need to know <clears throat> about uh, a little bit about the biology of the and, and, and anatomy of the uh, uh, spectacle. So this is a histologic section of a snake. I forget what kind of a snake it uh, it is, but here is the cornea. It's uh, uh, cornea just like you'd find in anything else. It's continuous here with the sclera. Notice that there's no cartilage and no bone in the in the sclera. This is the this is the lens, of course. This is the iris of the snake. We just looked at some snakes' uh, 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 irides, and uh, and uh, so the cornea is is as posi positioned as it would be in any other animal. There's some details about it that I'll go into in, in a little bit. But then you notice covering the outside of that. There's a different, a completely different structure, which is the spectacle. The spectacle is, a, uh, uh, you can think of it as the fusion of the upper and lower eyelids. Uh, uh, and and it's, uh, all, you can also think of it as a very specialized scale, because the snake skin <coughs> is made up of, of, uh, uh, of scales. The spectacle has its own epithelium on the surface. And, the, and then uh, there's this uh, tiny little area here, which I've labeled as the cuticle. Uh, which is separated from the uh, rest of the spectacle. Uh, that, the separation is an artifact, but, uh, but it's a, one of these things that's an Im important artifact. Uh, and, uh, and so, the, so then uh, there's a, uh, a space. It, it's actually much more of a potential space than a big space like we see here, which is called the subspectacular space. Uh, it's in, I like it because if you get inflammation of this, you have subspectacular inflammation uh, and that, uh, the, the subspectacular space is filled with a fluid. That fluid is uh, from the lacrimal gland, 
So I said earlier that snakes don't have a tear film. Well, they do have tears. It's just that those tears do not populate the surface of the eye. They, uh, they uh, fill and occupy this space, which is the uh, subspectacular, uh, subspectacular space. Um, and in interestingly, uh, just, just as uh, tears uh, in, uh, in, in, an, in a mammalian eye, they also uh, they, they secrete a mucinous component, which is uh, lubricating. <clears throat> and uh, you may or may not know that <clears throat> snakes, when they eat, uh, they don't chew. They don't, uh, they don't uh, separate things out. Whatever, whatever they take in, they swallow whole. And uh, to help lubricate that process, <clears throat> the snake is able to squeeze uh, uh, lacrimal fluid, tear film, tear film fluid, or, or tear fluid into the oral cavity <clears throat> to help uh, with that uh, heroic swallowing effort. <clears throat> so this is a, a higher magnification picture of that spectacle, <clears throat> and uh, uh, with a, uh, an areas label. I call this the cuticle. That's really sort of my pet name for it because the uh, the, the anatomic name for it is the outer generation which I think is kind of a dumb name uh, for, for, uh, for a structure, but they call it the outer ge gener generation. It's a, a layer that's made up entirely of keratin. It's, there are no cells in that, in that, in that layer. <clears throat> and then there's a <coughs> newly forming inner generation here. Here's, here is the connective tissue of the spectacle itself down here. And I want to point out the fact that there are blood vessels uh, in, in, in the spectacle. This is a, a, a dead snake which has been perfused with, uh, with latex, uh, and, and so the blood vessels of the spectacle are, are easily visible here, and this is what they look like uh, if you were able to see, uh, able to see them. Now, uh, people say that snakes shed their skin, which gives, so the saying that sort of gives me the willies, because of course a snake can't shed its skin. Nobody could shed their skin and, and, and survive. Uh, even, uh, even worse, because it's talking about the eyes, people say that snakes shed their spectacle. Well, just the same, they can't shed their spectacle. The, the, the eye would be exposed and horrible things would happen. What they shed is just purely this completely acellular outer generation uh, uh, keratin. And here is the, the shed, recently shed uh, 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 outer generation from a snake. and. Uh, Curiously, the uh, the uh, shed from the from the rest of the body, the the non-ocular tissues of the body, are, is translucent and has pi uh, pigment in it. For reasons that are uh, uh, functionally obvious, the the uh, shed over the over the spectacle is uh, 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 transparent. And uh, the reason why I said that uh, if you're a veterinarian uh, or a veterinary ophthalmologist, you need to know about the spectacle is largely because there are a number of different um, uh, problems associated with snake eye, which are completely associated with a, uh, the poor quality of the shedding of the, of the spectacle over, over the eye. And they can be a sign of a number of different things. They can be a sign of uh, um, uh, management issues, uh, humidity issues, uh, infections, damage to the eye, nutritional problems uh, uh, will uh, uh, cause this uh, transition from the inner generation, this new uh, uh, cuticle, I'm going to call it, uh, and, uh, and um, the formation of the outer generation so that the shedding doesn't happen uh, properly. Now, in the, in the cycle, uh, most of the snake's life it, uh, lives with a, with a completely clear spectacle. Uh, there are no, uh, there's no blood in the blood vessels of the spectacle. Uh, and the snake is uh, 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 happily going about its business, uh, 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 using its uh, crystal clear eyes uh, uh, just fine. Shortly before ecdysis, which is the uh, term that we use for uh, shedding in a snake, uh, the, the spectacle will, uh, the first thing that happens is those blood vessels in the spectacle will uh, allow blood to, to go into them, and also they'll become uh, leaky. The reason for that is they need, before they can shed this, out, this outer generation, they need to form a completely new inner generation um, uh, because the, uh, their uh, spectacle is at risk if, the, if it doesn't have that pr uh, protective layer. Um, so that's an energy requiring uh, 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 achievement uh, 
And in order to have that, it has to have blood in its bl uh, blood vessels. And in order for the nutrients to get to the epithelium where that ha is happening, then uh, they have to be leaky. The spectacle will become cloudy. And during that period of time, the snake often becomes uh, temperamental uh, or, or grouchy. Uh, and immediately before shedding, everything clears up. The blood, uh, the blood leaves the spectacle. The, everything clears up. And the snake returns to a, 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 a placid uh, personality or snake analogy, I guess. And, uh, uh, and then sh uh, shedding occurs uh, uh, shortly after that. Now, the, let's go back one. Now, the cornea in a mammal, where the cornea is exposed, has an epithelium on, on the surface. Uh, and it needs that epithelium for a lot of the same reason that the snake has a, has a spectacle. Uh, the, if you look histologically at the snake eye like we, we would have here, you'd say, oh, there's no epithelium on, on here. Also, you'd say, oh, there's no epithelium on the back of the spectacle. But it's there. If you actually follow this um, cavity, this subspectacular space back to what would be the equivalent of the fornix, the, the ed edges of the conjunctiva, you can easily see the epithelium. But if you, if you perturb this in any way, if there's inflammation or trauma or, or anything else, then that epithelium will regrow very rapidly. Also, the epithelium in the back of the spectacle will, will uh, become uh, very apparent. Of course, the reason why uh, uh, that uh, epithelium atrophies to begin with is uh, that uh, uh, it's protected. It's in a liquid environment and is protected and doesn't need the protective effect that you normally think of. So this is just a, a couple of uh, sheds. Uh, you, can, uh, you can take this shed. If you had some problem, you can take it and uh, submit it to a pathologist, and we can make some in interpretation. This is just the pathology of just the shed. Another thing that uh, the snakes did inherit from their reptilian ancestors that mammals don't have is uh, skeletal muscle in their, in their iris and, and ciliary body. And there, I mean, there's a whole talk about the usefulness of skeletal muscle especially in the bird eyes. Um, if, you did, uh, if you looked in the back of the eye of a snake, you'd think that they have blood vessels in the retina. And what they, what they have instead is uh, blood vessels that are actually in front of the retina, uh, uh, draped over the front of the retina, like you'd spread a, 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 of a sheet. Uh, uh, and uh, actually, the, the only uh, vertebrates that have blood vessels actually in the retina are mammals. And not all mammals have blood vessels either. Uh, and then uh, this is the, this happens to be the head of a rattlesnake that we got not, uh, not too long ago, and uh, uh, I wanted to throw this in here because I want to talk about this structure right here. You're probably aware that uh, snakes also have, in addition to uh, uh, having uh, visual function from visible light, they also can detect heat. Uh, not, not all snakes can do this, but all of the vipers can. And this is a histologic section through the, with a pit organ of, a, of, a rattles, of this rattlesnake. And it looks very simple, and I don't understand much about the physiology of the pit organ, but there's a, a highly vascular membrane that covers over the back, uh, and it's able to um, convert that into a, uh, some sort of directional uh, 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 understanding of where heat is uh, coming from. Uh, uh, a, a whole different kind of sensation of, uh, of long, long wavelength light or infrared light. And then I want to end here just to show how much fun we have in, uh, uh, as a veterinary as a veterinary ocular uh, pathologist. These two snakes came into the vet school to be autopsied, and I didn't do the autopsy. I didn't do anything other than make some recommendations as to how to uh, proceed. And it turned out they have larval worms all over the, all over the face, uh, including uh, around the eyes. So I uh, also recommended a, a, a parasitologist that they could use to try and identify these worms. Uh, and lo and behold, genetically, they were a unique species. And when it came back, they, uh, the name of the species was Serp Serpent Rhabdus de Bilzegai. So <laughs> I take some pride in that. I'll be happy if there are questions to handle uh, questions. Otherwise, we'll learn something about snakes in Madison. Well, I want to thank Dick DeBelzik for this incredibly informative talk. Um, we're running a little late. 
Uh, he's been my husband for more than 50 years, but I want to introduce a new um, passion uh, in my life uh, worldwide. Would you come up here, please? Yeah. 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 So, um, can you hear me? Is this working? <laughs> so, Will came onto the board of the Friends of the Lakeshore Nature Preserve, of which I'm a past president now. And he came on as a student, as a student board member. We have two student board members. He came on as a junior, and he continued as a senior, graduating in June of, in May of 2022. And uh, now he's working in the AIDS Virus Research Lab with uh, Dr. David O'Connor, and he is now the president of the Friends of the Lakeshore Nature Preserve. So that's how I got to know him. And even though I knew him from his work as a poet, he organizes an open mic for us, and his being everywhere all at once, uh, uh, I only learned last summer about his research into the snakes of uh, Dane County. And so we're very pleased to have him here today. Thank you, Will. Thank you, Doris. And uh, thanks everyone for coming today. This is really exciting. And thanks to Dick for giving that fascinating talk about, about snake eyes. I knew little of that beforehand. So um, now this, this part of the talk, um, I guess it, it's my job to speak about, after all we know about snake eyes, uh, I guess, what are the snakes that live around us here in Madison, and uh, what do we know about them ecologically, how they live, and how we may encounter them as well. So um, I first learned about snakes and, and the urban ecology of snakes at the Urban Ecology Center in Milwaukee, uh, a really great place to go. They have three different locations. They do all sorts of amazing citizen science work there, so wanted to throw their name in here as well. But why don't we get started? Um, I just want to give you all a roadmap about what to expect from this talk. We're going to talk about seeing snakes, uh, how, how our eyes and our visual system uh, has in some ways become really in tune uh, to finding snakes. And then also just the how scary snakes can be too uh, and, and working around that. Uh, also why we should care about snakes, uh, their ecology and some cool facts about them. Uh, we're going to talk about the snakes where we live here in Madison that, that I've done a little bit of work researching. And uh, we're also going to conclude with how we can see the good in snakes and the snakes that live around us. So why don't we uh, jump in? So I, I want to start that ophidiophobia, or the, the, I guess, being scared of snakes, is a real thing. Uh, and this is a, a Carl Linnaeus here, who's the, the father, considered the father of modern taxonomy. He named all these different animals with those Latin names, those confusing, italicized names that we put in front of every species. Uh, and he had this to say about snakes. He said, these foul, loathsome creatures are abhorrent. Uh, and then listed a number of things that he despised about snakes. Um, so again, uh, if, if you also share similar feelings about snakes, know that you're not alone. Uh, you know, people have been saying these things uh, since, you know, I guess pretty much the, the first things that have ever been written or, or said uh, by humankind. Um, but I, I hope by the end of this presentation that we will uh, also see the, the good that snakes have to offer. Um, but, you know, it, it, this isn't completely Linnaeus's fault, I think, his, uh, his abhorrence for snakes, uh, because th there's been a lot of research about how biologically humans and primates, uh, their visual systems are super in tune to recognizing snakes and immediately react in a, a fearful manner. So um, this paper here, just to briefly show, um, they showed macaques a number of different photos and measured their brain activity. And they saw that a picture of a snake, which is this one right here, if you can't tell, uh, induces a really strong neuronal response. And then also the neurons fire a lot faster in reaction to a snake than reaction to photos of anything else, a, a macaque face, a hand, or just a random shape. <coughs> Snakes really evoke a powerful biological response in the, the visual system of primates. Uh, similar thing has been found in humans. Um, here you see this is a, a picture of a snake, uh, but what the researchers did is they've obscured it in various steps all the way back to where you can barely tell there's a snake there, and then they showed these slides sequentially to people and asked them, what animal can you see in this photo? And it turns out that uh, humans are also really good at recognizing snakes, even when they're really camouflaged. So if we go back here, 
even at step three, almost 50% of the participants were able to recognize that there's a snake in that photo. Of course, it's difficult here because this is really small, but if it were the whole screen, I bet you could probably tell the same. And, and that's a lot quicker than if it was a cat or a bird or a fish. Uh, snakes, again, invoke a really strong visual uh, brain response in humans. So um, this, uh, this terror we have for snakes and our ability to really rapidly detect them uh, has actually turned out now to be a real detriment to the, the snakes. Uh, because we, you know, humans, we've, we've covered the world with our societies and with our, our urban environments and also with our terror for snakes. And so, like this, this meek garter snake here, the last thing it wants to do is, is mess with you as a person. Um, but unfortunately, lots of snakes are killed um, because of this, this innate terror we have for them, uh, when a lot of times they are perfectly harmless. In Wisconsin, we have 21 different species, uh, but only two of those are, are venomous or could be dangerous to you um, in your life. Uh, most of them are, are very, well, even the venomous ones are, are very shy, solitary, and they do not want to have anything to do with you. Um, but you can see that of those 21 species, uh, we have nine species of special conservation concern, and four of those species are also endangered. So more than half of the species of snakes we have here in the state uh, have been, are, are threatened or endangered in their, um, in their native habitats. So if you're interested in about the, the snakes that you can find near you, the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources has lots of maps uh, depicting the ranges of the different snakes that we have. So why should we care about snakes? Why should we care that they're potentially in trouble because of all of our activities as humans? Well, they're the most abundant reptile taxon we have here in Wisconsin. Uh, we don't have you know, lizards and, or Komodo dragons or you know, uh, other reptiles like other parts of the world do, but we do have snakes. They're also mesopredators, or they, um, they sort of exist in the, the middle of the food chain in our ecosystems, uh, meaning that they eat a lot of insects and small mammals and things that are, are directly feeding upon the plants that soak in energy from the sun. But they also are eaten by predators higher up in the food chain, like eagles and coyotes and opossums, raccoons, other sorts of bird and mammalian predators. And so they are really crucial in the, the flow of energy up through our ecosystems. Another thing that's important in this is that they're ectothermic, or some people call this cold-blooded, that they don't generate their own body heat like we do. And so they have to absorb it from the outside. But what that means is they don't spend energy creating that heat like we do. And so they're a lot more efficient. All the energy that they take from the, the plants that you know, this snail eats and then the snake eats the snail, that snake holds on to more of the snail energy. And so then when it's eaten by a, a bird up above, more of that energy flows up and isn't just burned as heat like we do. So um, because of that, we do really worry that snakes are under threat around the world because of how crucial they are in so many ecosystems, like ours in Wisconsin. And so this, this study came out recently that uh, analyzed threats to reptiles generally around the world. And what they found is that uh, urban and agricultural development are the two main leading causes for uh, snake, um, I guess, the, 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 um, the threat to snake species around the world. And uh, just as it's, you know, is happening in, in Africa and in Asia and in the Amazon, uh, snakes are feeling those same pressures here in Wisconsin. So um, speaking specifically to urban development, urban environments are really hazardous to snakes because they're full of roads and pollutants and domestic and feral animals, cats and dogs and um, you know, in some parts of the country we have pigs, not here in Wisconsin, luckily. Um, but also human hostility, like we talked about earlier, the people who see snakes like Carl Linnaeus did, uh, or are simply just terrified of snakes. Um, lots of snakes are, are killed that way, too. But the snakes that live here, they, they have to make do. Uh, and that there are snakes that live on Madison. We'll talk about them in a little bit. Uh, but so these urban environments, despite all these hazards, are still relevant. There, there are snakes that live among us. Uh, but these habitats are fragmented by the roads, as we were talking about, and they're also perilous because of those animals and because of humans, because of cars on the roads. And so urban snakes, they face reduced mobility and increased mortality here in, in urban areas. So knowing that, I was really interested about what kind of snakes we have here in Madison, 
being a, an urban area, but also with lots of amazing parks. So this is a map of the, the study sites that I, I looked at in 2021 um, and the, um, the, the different ar arrays that I had to, to look for snakes. So I, I looked all over Dane, or at least the, the Madison area, and I, I found a number of different snakes. So we're going to spend the remainder of the, the talk here looking at some of the snakes that are your neighbors here in Madison and uh, a little bit about them. So uh, the first snake that I want to mention is the Decay's brown snake, and they're these these small little cute uh, like beige uh, almost pinkish colored uh, brown snakes and uh, they love eating slugs that's their favorite thing to do they uh, they pretty much spend their whole life uh, in leaf litter and, and burrowed you know sort of in in loose soil looking for slugs and, and worms and so they're a, a gardener's friend they're great to have in your garden because they eat all of those slugs and other little insects that would otherwise eat your hostas or your vegetables or your, your mushrooms or whatever else you're harvesting from your garden and they're also really widespread all over the state uh, and they're known to be especially hardy snakes in urban environments because they don't require much they just need a little plot with some slugs and some cover and uh, they will be happy uh, their cousins are the red-bellied snakes, which look really similar from the top. They're almost a darker color. But if you see their belly, which they'll oftentimes roll over to try and spook you, uh, it's a bright red color. Uh, and so these snakes, again, they love eating slugs. In the Arboretum, they were uh, studied and found to eat a lot of invasive slugs. So as mesopredators, then, they're also acting to control invasive species, which is really important. And uh, they tend to occupy more moist forest environments than the, the, red, or the decays brown snake does. The common garter snake is probably one of the, the most common species that you'll, you'll find here in Madison. They, uh, they can be about the same size as the brown snakes, but they'll also grow uh, to be a lot longer, up to three feet sometimes. Uh, and they have a really wide diet because as they grow in size, their mouth also grows and they're able to fit different types of food uh, into that mouth. And so um, they're, they're really kind of a, they, they have an incredibly wide array of different things that they can do, uh, including eating toads and other amphibians, mice, uh, rodents, bird eggs. Um, they, they have a really, really wide diet. And they're also the most studied of, of all snakes that we have here because of their, how common they are. Uh, they've also become a bit of a, a model organism in, in research. And what's really cool is that these snakes break a lot of the, the molds that we put on reptiles and, uh, and cold-blooded creatures generally, that they, they can be very social. They live in, in congregate groups. They also give birth to live young. They, uh, they're also both venomous and poisonous. Uh, their venom comes from fangs far back in their mouth, so when people are bitten, they're really never, ever envenomated. But if it's swallowing a toad, uh, if the toad's already halfway in its mouth, then the toad gets a, a dose of this venom just to stop it from kicking as it's, it's swallowed. Uh, but what, what it can do then is, because toads also have poisons in them, in their, they have some glands on their shoulders, and the snake can then incorporate those poisons so then it's less... Uh, appetizing for a bird or anything else that may want to eat it. So the common garter snake is pretty cool. The, the plains garter snake is a relative of the common garter snake. Um, and in Wisconsin, it's actually a species of relative of, um, of special concern. Uh, so it, it's a lot less common. And uh, I was able to detect it at one site here in Madison at a historic uh, high lime prairie, uh, which is hotter and drier than a lot of the other prairies that I looked at. And uh, the plains garter snake likes it uh, really hot and dry. They're from farther west and farther south from here. We're at the, the, the very sort of northern uh, eastern edge of their range. And uh, they coexist with the common garter snake because they're able to be active at hotter and drier times of day or at hotter and drier areas. And so the two species, while they eat very similar things, can exist in the same place, um, just sort of trading uh, their activity cycles based on how hot or wet or cold or dry uh, the conditions currently are. Another really cool snake that I, I found is the, the eastern milk snake. Uh, they are, are red and white and associated with dairy farms. So I vote this snake as the most Wisconsin of snakes that we have in Madison. Uh, and uh, they are the, they're, they're the largest snake that I was able to personally find uh, here in, in the Madison area. Uh, and they really like to live in the rocky foundations of, of old barns and houses and also any rocky crags that naturally occur. And so that's where they, they get their name, the milk snake, because they were seen often around barns. 
uh, and there's a, a like a folk's tale that these snakes would feed upon the, the milk of the, the cows, which is not true, um, but they were certainly eating the mice and other critters in the barn as well and likely living in the, the rocky foundation. And the, the, this coloration they have um, is meant to be really visually striking for, you know, mammals and other creatures like us to come across this snake. Uh, this snake wants to advertise that it looks very similar to something that could be venomous. There's a snake that lives on the, the eastern seaboard south from here called the coral snake that has a very similar pattern and the milk snake mimics that pattern. The milk snake is not venomous at all. The coral snake is very venomous um, and the, the milk snake then benefits from people mistaking it for a venomous creature, which um, has not become so beneficial in the age of humans intentionally killing any venomous snake that they can see. The milk snake also eats other snakes. So it's part of a genus of snakes called Lampropeltis, or king snakes. And sort of like the king cobra, uh, it, it's a similar naming uh, uh, tactic that um, these king snakes are, are the kings of other snakes because they eat them. So likely if you find uh, eastern milk snakes on your property or in Madison, that they're also existing in an ecosystem that has other smaller snakes that these snakes feed upon. So to, to wrap up here, I want to talk about seeing the, the good in snakes uh, as we, we, we move forward. So again, I, I want to mention that snakes that live here in, in urban environments, um, these environments are relevant for snakes. You can find them here. They are there. Um, but we have to recognize that Madison is a, a fragmented and perilous place for snakes to exist. And so with that in mind, we want to know, too, that these snakes are really crucial to our ecosystems, and we want to foster them as much as we can. And so uh, they are crucial because they're abundant, uh, even though um, they're really hard to find. There can be lots of snakes on a property. Um, and they're also uh, they're really energy efficient, and they facilitate the flow of energy through our ecosystems. And they're also really marvelous uh, for a number of the reasons that Dick mentioned about their eyes, but their, their whole physiology and their whole ecology is really fascinating as well. They're, they're useful in that way in our ecosystems, and they're really mostly harmless. So I, I also want to use snakes uh, to, to talk about this idea of um, umbrella species. Uh, an umbrella species is a, a species in, in conservation that if you conserve that species, it can sort of support a lot of other species under its umbrella. So we think often of large cats, like uh, snow leopards or uh, lions or, or cougars as umbrella species because if you, uh, or wolves even, if you support large you know, predators and their ecosystems, you're also, by doing so, supporting uh, the rest of the species under their, uh, their umbrella. I want to argue that snakes are a good urban umbrella species because of all of their, um, all of their needs and their, uh, their weaknesses to our fragmented urban landscape, that if we're able to make our urban landscape more snake friendly, that we would by doing so also make our urban landscapes friendly for so many other species as well, including amphibians and by, by that as well, birds and mammals and, and all of the, the wonderful neighbors we have here in Madison. So uh, with that, Thank you for coming to this, this event. Uh, I want to also say that if you, if you do see a snake while you're out there, um, definitely report uh, to iNaturalist. There are also, there's a, a website called Hurt Mapper that's specific for reptiles and amphibians. If you wanted to get an identification for a snake that you found, uh, you can also uh, report if you see a snake dead on the side of a road. The DNR also has a road mort mortality survey. Uh, and if you want to learn more, the Partners for Amphibian and Reptile Conservation are a really great resource. The Madison Area Herpetological Society uh, and the Urban Ecology Center, as I mentioned. And look for events on the DNR events calendar, too. They have herpetologists on there frequently. So and many thanks for, for this project as well. Thank you all. And we uh, have a few minutes. All right, well, thank you. Um, so do we have any questions for, we have a few minutes. Okay, do we, do we have a question? What's your question? He wants to know how snakes have yellow eyes. Okay, that sounds like a dick question. <laughs> I would bet that there are snakes that have yellow eyes. We have to. Let's do. Let's do this. Uh, here, I'll 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 serve as uh, I'll serve as the uh, MC. 
I would bet that some snakes have yellow eyes, but it's not something uh, that I know. Just. I would bet that there's a good, uh, an interesting question uh, answer as to the question, why are they yellow? But I don't know the answer to that either. <laughs> I, uh, uh, I have uh, often argued that there's a whole totally uh, 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 ignored field of science uh, uh, in studying the, the coloration of bird eyes. Uh, and I'm less passionate about uh, reptile or snake eyes, but since, uh, since most reptiles have uh, great color vision, they probably also have uh, uh, var uh, varieties of colors of their, of their irises that uh, would be interesting to study. But I do not know about snakes. Sounds like a good question for you to answer or something. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. Uh, other questions? Yeah. It's not about snakes per se, but uh, the turtle has a, a, only one kind of a, a light receiving uh, retina, apparently. But uh, do we know why? I mean, are they are they daytime animals? Or, 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 or yet? There are some night things, so. Most reptiles are diurnal, and, uh, and I, uh, I, I, I would uh, be willing to bet that you're wrong about uh, uh, one, only one phenotype of photoreceptor in the, in the turtle. That would be unusual. They have, uh, this is getting uh, way off tangent, but they have oil droplets in their, in their cones, and they have different color variations of oil droplets, which strongly suggest that they have different color uh, phenotype of, uh, of cones. Uh, most uh, reptile, I'm, uh, uh, there are probably some uh, nocturnal turtles, but I'm, I'm not aware of that. They... So, keeping with that question then, no one's asked, but what do snakes see from a color perspective? I mean, they're predators, and so they're looking for things that move, so they have higher acuity vision. Um, but does it vary from snake to snake? Well, they have small eyes. Uh, so they're not going to be in, uh, in the visual acuity range of, of your birds or even your, your uh, uh, li lizards and, and, and what have you. They have, although they may be nocturnal, uh, it's an, inter an interesting thing about nocturnal uh, reptiles is uh, uh, the, the re uh, retinal cells that are adapted for dim light vision are modified from, from cones. Uh, probably this is uh, best understood in the geckos. Uh, 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 although most geckos are, are nocturnal hunters, not all of them, but most geckos are nocturnal hunters, They're, the cells in the retina that function as rods, as dim light sensing photoreceptors, uh, are derived from cones. And uh, interestingly, even in dim light, the geckos maintain color vision. I don't know if that, I don't think that even comes close to answering your do question. They but, do they oh, they see color. Uh, I don't know that anybody's tested snakes in particular, probably have. Uh, they would have. Uh, they, they, I'm sure that they would have the retinal capability of seeing color, and the, and there are many diurnal snakes uh, who have uh, who, who function in bright light, and uh, certainly their their genetic background would be uh, rich in uh, ability to see color. So on one of those diagrams, that there were oil yellow oil droplets that were down by the fovea of the animals, and so suggest that they. At least some wavelengths or so. And I have one question for Will too. So you mentioned how the when the snakes flip around, they're red on the on the bottom, and that's kind of a warning sign. Um, and I was noticed that one of the snakes we have here is all black on the other. But you don't think of them rearing up or what, unless you're a cobra. Um, and so I just had a brief thought that maybe that's to absorb heat or so. The idea of why why snakes have different different patterns of coloration on their bellies versus their their tops. That's really interesting observation. Yeah, thanks for the question. So for the, I guess, the purpose of absorbing heat, that could be. I'll have to see the, the snake uh, that we have here. Um, but I know for the red-bellied snake generally and lots of other snakes, uh, because snakes, they, they, they can't move very fast. Some of them, like the, the mambas, can be really, really fast. But generally, snakes, compared to something that has legs, um, they're really uh, pretty slow. And so a lot of times, snakes have, ev have evolved other ways of trying to avoid predators uh, instead of just running away. And a lot of that, yeah, I guess, uh, an effective strategy has been to play dead. 
So lots of snakes will simply flip over, maybe they'll secrete some foul-smelling fluid, and they'll flash some bright colors, and maybe even writhe a little bit, um, and try to seem as unappetizing as possible. So uh, whenever They're there's already a there. <laughs> Uh, whenever there's a different color uh, on their belly, because snakes generally don't like to be flipped over, because then it's it's tougher for them to get away. Then they'd have to flip back over to escape. Um, it's kind of a, a, a a tactic of last resort. Yeah. Hopefully that answers yeah, your yeah, question. Yeah, that's, that's, that's great. Thank you very much. Okay. I think so, we have one here. Oh, please. Yeah. We were wondering, does it hurt when a snake sheds its skin? Well. I would ask your snake that question. <laughs> I, I really don't know. So Dick did mention that snakes can get a little more irritable while they're shedding, uh, which could be from discomfort. Uh, but yeah, that like, you would really have to somehow ask the, the snake. Uh, I've never shed my skin myself, or, or shed my, my outer uh, exterior coating. So. I don't know, my guess would be no, and that they're irritable because they're worried about, uh, they're vulnerable, that would be my my sense there, but yes, we have another one. Uh, so if we were wanting to search for snakes in our urban environment or our backyards, what's the best way to kind of start something like that? Just poke it under rocks or? Yeah, good question. So um, w when I looked at the, in different parks around Madison, I did so under the authority and the, the permitting process of uh, Madison City Parks and the university. Um, and Dane County Parks. And so all, all animals that exist in our parks, rightly so, are protected by those parks. Um, and so it, to go out and look for snakes uh, you know, in, in a park somewhere, um, the best thing to do is just to, to walk on the trails and keep an eye out for them. And if, if you see them, keep your distance, uh, respect them and, uh, and their own you know, purpose and, and what they're doing out there. Um, and likely, if you go out um, especially on either like early in the spring, a, a really warm day in the spring, or a, a warm day later in the fall, you'll see snakes just trying to soak in the, the sun either before winter starts or to warm up as they're coming out of, of hibernation. So those are really good times to go out and look for snakes and, and see them out and about. Uh, in your own backyard where you have a little more leeway, um, having objects like, like wood boards, uh, or if you wanted to flip over rocks, um, those would all be good ways to look for snakes because they're really secretive and like to hide under things. So what I did was I had a bunch of, of pine wood boards from the hardware store and I laid them out and then I, I flipped them over and looked for snakes underneath. I have another burning question for Dick. I've known you for a very, very long time and I've always wanted to ask this question. So you get eyes from all over the world. I mean, you have blue whale eyes, giant squid, things wash up on a shore, the first thing they think of is taking out the eyeball and sending it to you. <laughs> so, and it's a fascinating uh, collection. Do they give you a heads up or do you just get like a, a box in the mail and you have to figure out what it is? Combination of both. We do get head, uh, heads up. Uh, uh, not so much anymore, but uh, I, we used to have relationships with a number of different zoos. Uh, and I would send them a list of, uh, uh, of preferred eyeballs, uh, and we'd get a, 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 a box with a number of different eyes at the, at the same time. And then we would pick and choose. Uh, uh, some, uh, some, there are some animals we have tons of already and uh, uh, don't need any more, uh, so uh, I, would, I would pick and choose among those. I don't know, do we still, is that, does that still ring true? Gillian uh, Shaw, who's uh, the main mover of the Copalow Lab these days, says that's still true. But, uh, but sometimes, we'll, uh, uh, some, so, some people will ask us ahead of time what we're interested in. Uh, we recently got some uh, echidna eyes, which is a, uh, an egg-laying mammal from uh, the Australia area. And I really badly wanted to see their eyes. Uh, so uh, uh, I was talking to a veterinary ophthalmologist and how uh, it would be great to study that. And he came through with some, some echidna eyes. Just yesterday, I turned over what we didn't, what we didn't use to the zoology museum. It sounded like kitten, but I think it was something totally different. <laughs> right. Just goes to show you the best laboratory we have is, is the world. Um, I was reading that snakes can not only see in IR, as you mentioned, but in UV. How do they see and what do they see in UV and at what times of year is that a big deal for them? So many reptiles have uh, uh, UV-sensitive uh, 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 photoreceptors. Uh, 
I don't know specifically about snakes, but it wouldn't surprise me if there were some snakes that uh, see, uh, they have photoreceptors that see in the ultraviolet. And do snakes light up um, if you shine a UV light on them? In other words, is there a way they might see each other? Will, Will has, a, has oh, a shot yeah. at that one. Can <laughs> you let you off the hook? <laughs> That's an interesting question, Tom. I Something that, at least that, that I know about snakes, is that they, they interact with each other less on the, the visual uh, spectrum and more via smell. Uh, snakes really are perceptive uh, with their, both their nose and also their tongue in smelling. That's why snakes always, uh, their tongues are flicking in and out. And they communicate via pheromones so that they'll release different smells that they can pick up over a long distance and communicate with each other that way. So I, I don't know whether they um, also have visual cues, but a lot of how snakes socialize, like we were talking about with garter snakes, um, is going to be on that, that smell level rather than visually. Yeah, I'm going to come over here. I'll take a. I'll, if you want to come around there, I'll yep. take that. I'll take a quick. Okay. So it's interesting because it's only within the last few years, uh, uh, and I don't know why, people started looking at animals with with uh, ultraviolet light, and lo and behold, a number of different animals, so uh, including mammals, uh, 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 sh show color uh, uh, when, when looked at. Show. Uh, what, I can't remember what the word is. Uh, Fluorescence when the when you shine a uh, UV light on it. I don't know if people have uh, put a bunch of snakes through that test or not, but it wouldn't surprise me if there were snakes that that uh, uh, were were glow, glow in the dark with a with with the, with, the, with, the, with the UV light. What the advantage would be for any, any of the mammals or snakes that do that, I don't know. My question is, can we come visit the collection of eyes? Uh, so uh, I used to advertise our, our, our collection of eyes as an eye museum. Uh, that was probably a mistake because uh, people have a different uh, perception of what a museum is than, than what we actually have. Uh, if you're a fan of uh, drawers, <laughs> we have lots of drawers. Uh, but I do, uh, I have started and, I, and I'm um, looking uh, more and more for uh, audiences for this. Uh, I love to uh, sit down with a bunch of microscope slides and uh, demonstrate uh, firsthand using using the actual tissue uh, uh, comparative anatomy and uh, uh, particularly in the in the light of uh, of uh, uh, of uh, evolution. I'm doing a session for for Mary uh, McPherson Eye Research Institute researchers uh, next Thursday and then the Thursday after that. Uh, but um, I would I would entertain the possibility of someone if there were a group of people that were interested in doing that. That's, that's a great plug. Um, we, that's for right now, that's for researchers within the Eye Institute because we're, we're kind of beta testing that. So how that would work out with the rest of the community because you're using a microscope and um, so things like that. So we're you know, potentially seeing how things go. That might be something that we do. But it's, it is always kind of a, you know, how do you make that interface between you know, a, a, a real live working high level scientific laboratory and then a, a community interface, which is important to us to do, but we also have to do it right. Um, so that's a great point. Um, and I have a, one, I, I, one more question, too. So the spectacle, um, so it doesn't have windshield washer fluid, and it's like a windshield. So, you know, and they're burrowing animals. So the first thing you got to think is that they got to get them dirty, right? So I'm guessing, I think I know how they keep them clean, but. How do you think they keep them clean? Lick them. So you're thinking of a gecko. Ah. <laughs> a, ge a gecko also has a, a spectacle. Uh, which is interesting, and they do in fact keep their spectacle clean by uh, stretching their tongue around and licking the front of their eyes. Uh, snakes use their tongue for a number of different things, but I don't think they can reach reach or or uh, uh, flush their eyes with it. And I don't know the answer to your question. I've been asked that question and c c uh, considered it myself uh, quite often. But you, you, if you look at a snake eye, you, you seldom see uh, debris over the snake over the snake's eye, which is curious. Lots of questions still. So. Okay, any party questions? We do have um, do we, the snakes out in the, if you go out and then make a left, um, there, do we have just the one or do we have, we have three. So, the, the, um, so we have three snakes out there. Folks want to look at them. We aren't, I don't think we're going to have people handle them. They can touch them or 
they can touch but not kind of hold them just so that they don't get frightened and people don't drop them and then they scurry off. They can be a, I, at least that one of them I know looks pretty fast to me. So uh, we don't want to be having to spend the rest of the day finding it. So uh, we welcome you to do that, sit around at, or stick around, talk to our speakers. Um, and once again, thank you so much for, for coming here today and letting us do it. We enjoy it hopefully as much as you enjoy hearing it. And if I might add, I'd like to thank... Uh, I'd like Snakes, to thank Snakes and Bagels. Yeah. I'd like to thank Gail Stir for uh, suggesting this and Doris also for coming to the Biotech Center.